Once upon a time, there was a country. They called it the Pearl of the Orient, Cradle of the Brave. The islands caught between sea and sky and bright blazing sun. Once upon a time in that country, there was a king and his fair queen. They say that the king was once wise and just, but power corrupted him, and his queen was blinded by the glitter of diamonds. And so for many years, the land wept. Until one day, one warrior, braver than all the rest, stood his ground, shouted from his lonely cell in a lonely jail, until the king banished him across the seas, where his shouts would be muffled by the roaring tides. But the warrior returned, flying home on the wings of morning. And when he was murdered, his blood fed the land that he loved. The people looked at the warrior's widow, whose smile would never be the same again. They saw her stand that ground until that one bright day when the people stood against attacks. For her, they stood against dragons and sang beneath swords. Now this was a story I grew up with. This was a story most Filipinos of my generation grew up with. We believed that one day, when something wrong happened, when evil came, people will take a stand, will say, we will not allow this. The enemy will be coward and we will win. It's the mythology that this country lives with. It's the same mythology that assures us that today until at least 2016, we live under the kingdom of the Yellow King. But that's a different story from the stories I've learned the past few years. You see, I used to be a lifestyle writer. I uh, wrote about high heels and uh, fire trees and graduation and boys, which I would still like to write about now. But um, things change occasionally. And the reason I started looking at human rights and rapes and the disappeared and all that is not because I'm a good person. It's because I didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to believe that the pretty lady was a butcher and that there were men who were perfectly willing to take a stick and shove it up a communist vagina. But that is what's happening in this country. I'll tell you a story about the woman I know. Her name is Edith. Once she was a nun, or hoped to be a nun, and then she fell in love. So the man she loved loved her back, and they got married and had children, and everything was fine. And then martial law happened, and her husband was arrested. When he returned, they opened a small underground newspaper until the Ed's Revolution in 1986, because that was their narrative too. Jo Burgos died, her husband, at the age of 62. Her son, Jonas, was abducted in April of 2007. Right now, the military is saying that his name is Karamon, his alias is Karamon, and right now he's a member of a new people's army. His mother has never stopped trying to find her Jonas. Let me tell you another story, just to make sure. I think this time I'll let that story tell itself. I did not become president to be popular, to work, to lead, to protect and preserve our country, our people. That is why I became president. The dead of the regime of Gloria Macapagal Arroyo totals almost 2,000, all lost to extrajudicial killings. According to Karapatan, peasants, moros, human rights workers, government employees, lawyers, and scores of journalists were slaughtered with impunity. That's part of a documentary Kiri and I made last year. It's called 58. It took a long time for me to understand that if you tell stories, it doesn't mean the world will change. I thought what was wrong with people was that, like me, they didn't know anything. I thought the inside of the every man was good, that all you had to do is to call it out, to say something was wrong, and suddenly a raging battalion of angels would come down and fight the enemy. That's what I thought Edusso was. It's not true. People don't move like that because they always think it's someone's daughter or someone else's child or some other man who will go out there who has nothing to do with you. 
all of these people never thought, well, some of the activists did, but many of them never thought they would be part of that problem. I'd like to tell you a story about what happened in Maguindanao. Because when it happened in November of uh, 2009, when we heard about it, none of us really believed it. I'm sure everyone did who wasn't 24 and thought that the world was a happy place. I still sort of thought that people were good people. I am a better person now in that I do not believe anyone anymore. But uh, I flew to Maguindanao and did the smartest thing a daughter could do. I didn't tell my dad. I said I was in Tagaytay in a party. And I went to Maguindanao, and my boss let me, because she said, you know what, you would get a story out of there. We do not worry about you, because they locked down the massacre site. When I got there, it was crowded with people, and there were bodies everywhere. I had been covering human rights for three years, four years. I'd never seen a body. I come in after the fact. I look at the graves. I talk to the families. I got the bullets. There. It was as if nobody cared if the body were on the ground or on the car or whatever. And ANC called me and said, Pat, you have to report. So I picked up the phone and I said, OK, 46 bodies, 47, 48, 49. We're at 52, 53. They're not done yet. And they started pulling up cars. And they saw the Tamaro FX. And they saw Red Vios. And they saw several vans. And there was a woman there. and. Uh, she had on a white baseball cap, and she had, had a styrofoam of Jollibee, and she was looking for her father. And then she held my arm, and she wouldn't let go. The thing is, when you're 24, and you think that one way or the other, the world will, will conspire for you, it's disillusioning because you know that the world universe will never conspire for them. We counted the bodies. It made 57. Her father, her name is Reina Femomei. Her father was, uh, was the 58th. When these things happen, we say it's unthinkable, that it's unspeakable, that it's something that is unimaginable. But that's ridiculous, because we have seen them. We don't have to imagine them. They're there. They should have been spoken of, for example. When we knew about the, the private armies in Ampatuan, the chainsaw massacres in Abra, all these things. There is no reason for us to claim that we have the right to call anything unimaginable. In this country, in the Philippines, nothing is unimaginable. It is an accident for all of us to be alive today. Anyone can die any moment, any day, not because we believe in existentialism or anything. Just people die in this country. After Maguindanao, after the 58, every man in that group was considered a brother. Every byline was our byline. Every bullet was a bullet to the heart of democracy. This year, only nine journalists were killed under Aquino. Only nine. That's what they say. And it's an improvement. If you think of the only nine as just numbers, only nine, every one of that nine thought they would be alive this afternoon telling stories. Every one of that nine had families, had children, had worlds that were destroyed by something that happened then. I'd like to show you another story. Muhammad Palawan, husband to Rahima Palawan, was aware of the dangers of the convoy's mission. Kini naman po di ang lalaki pumunta doon. Baga sakali ang mga babae ni Patulan ni Gaw. Ano yung hindi patayin? The mga Dadato supporters who joined the convoy are mostly from impoverished families dependent on the mga Dadato dynasty. Kailangan niyang sumama doon dahil they are the mothers and fathers whose loyalty to the Mahudadatus now include offering up their children's lives. Ang pangalan ng anak ko, si Soraida Gagel Bernan. Ako ang ina ni Soraida Bernan. Yun ang anak ko nagbuntyo. Ang pangalan niya si Soraida Bernan. Gagel Bernan. Ako ang nanay ni Rowena Ante, yung anak ko na panganay. May dalawa siyang anak, puro babae nga sa akin siya. Yung isa dalaga, kung anin yan sa anak ko, Lailani Balayman. Yung isa, Pinky Balayman. Parang kanina lang sila namatay. Lalo na nag-aiyak itong mga anak niya. Ay, parang hindi ka makatulog, hindi ka makakain. 
magtabi yung katawan nila. Pinayakap. Kaya hindi ko kaya na mahiwala yung kapatid niya. Gusto ko yung magkayakap sila talaga. Pero mong kasaya-saya ng anak mong pagkalis niya, ganyan lang. Wisit na mga tao yan. The families are some of the most neglected among the victims in the sudden burst of aid after the massacre. In 2009, the office of the president, through the late presidential spokesperson, Serge Remonde, announced to the public that Arroyo would grant each family at least 100,000 out of her social fund. All four of these supporter families claim to have received nothing beyond the aid from Toto himself. Sa tulong ng gobyerno, ang nakuha lang namin yung bigay ni Governor sa amin na 20,000 na galing po mismo sa kay Governor Toto. Yun lang po ang natanggap na. The Aquino government appears to have taken little initiative to assist the families of victims on its own, especially the non-media members. Well, we will certainly look into this uh, concern because <clears throat> this was a commitment made by the <clears throat> previous administration that we, we are willing to uh, revisit this uh, proposal. Ang pagkamatay ng anak ko na ni Tureda Bernan ay talagang massacred. Wala pa nagawa ng massacred na dito sa Maguindanao na katulad noon na inubos sila lahat na 57 ang namatay. Ngayon, kung hindi pagigising ang gobyerno natin, eh wala na tayong magagawa. tell you why we tell stories, why Kiri and I do, and why so many other journalists, once they see Magindanao or see what's been happening, keep telling them. We tell them because we know that people don't do anything, not because they're bad people, because we never did anything before. People don't do anything because they weren't there and they don't have the imagination to put themselves in the place of everyone else and say, this could have been my brother, my sister, my cousin. That's what we are here to do because we are cursed with imaginations, because we see them every day, that every man, woman, and child who dies is suddenly our father, our brother, or sister. We hope to tell you the stories in the hope that you'll tell someone else. We don't believe it'll change the world. We just hope one more person will listen so that the names of those 58, and if you notice, everyone died in November 23, will not be forgotten. I'll end with one last thing. The month after Maguindanao, my staff and I, none of us slept. We, were, we had nightmares, we were afraid. We had phone calls from every member of the 58 that we ever interviewed, at least the families, because they felt we, they could talk to us. Every night that month, every time I closed my eyes, this is what I saw. I saw a backhoe, I saw a body dropping at my feet, and then I'd step back. And the reason I tell the story again and again is because I cannot forget and because sometimes I'm afraid I will. Have a nice day.